Hello there everyone and welcome back to episode 3 of us playing as a good old United Kingdom in which we are led by Barry Donville. <clears throat> the 1963 budget statement however. Mr. Speaker, honorable members, I would like to begin the presentation of the 1963 budget by stating that the government will not settle for last year's goals. Our economic position has increased by last year's efforts and so too should our ambitions. Therefore, I will upstate state up front that it is the government's goal to attain 4% economic growth by the end of the year. The morning paper said this was achievable. Rab Butler had read with particular interest of Financial Times before work. There was a general sense of optimism about the potential success of this year's economic goals. Though a gnawing doubt about the freedom of the times if voice and opposition kept his mood from ascending too high. While our ambitions have increased, our commitment to a sustainable ability has not changed. This government will maintain our goal to keep inflation below 3%. On the drive to, uh, to Westminster, Butler's driver turned the radio to the home service, squawking over the airwaves of uh, some second-rate journalist was Andrew Fountaine, talking about the confidence he had in the upcoming budget. Beneath all the usual rhetoric was some muted praise for Butler. The Chancellor thought he was just hedging his bets. In keeping with our focus on increasing our expectations, we believe that now is a time to shift our perspective from creating jobs to reducing unemployment. To the end, the government will now work towards a new goal of reducing our current rate of unemployment to 4%. Up the stairs towards the House of Commons, Butler saw in the hallways of the Prime Minister in conference, surrounded by businessmen. He recognized them as representatives of the German corporations, the men for whom this budget really served. Butler passed by them and opened the doors to the Commons, on to the next year, the Watchmen. As the wheels of British politics turn, the battles and the battles for the BPP begin. The German Reich, the true masters of Britain, watches on eagerly, its interest piqued by the news of a power struggle for the BPP. And for its eyes and ears, who else could possibly take up the role other than Wiesenmeier, Germany's most trusted representative, and the face of the Reich in Britain? Wiesenmeier had been appointed to Britain only a decade ago and appointing alongside Donville to restabilize Britain after the revolts of the 50s. In their decade of working together, he had come to respect Donville and admire in some ways the work he had done to save Britain. Donville had been a fine leader on the whole, keeping Britain safe and working hand in hand with the Reich, yet it wasn't Donville, whose encore seemed ever closer by the minute who currently preoccupied Wiesenmeier, but his all too likely his successors Andrew Fontaine and Rob Butler. Fontaine. I would keep the flame of, of uh, mm, uh, our ideology burning in Britain, and to finish the work of transforming Britain, yet he also offered instability, a young and inexperienced element who could bring Britain back into the chaos, just as Chesterton had. Butler had experience, and that he had in spades and could offer a calm and moderate hand to guide Britain into the future, but Butler was no, uh, no guy like us. And what only has been in the work laid down by his predecessors, his entourage also full of untrustworthy elements, and two people to leave Britain, both of whom he would almost certainly leave their mark on Britain. If he were to meet one, it would certainly help them in their struggle, but who was he to choose? Visa Ma picked up the phone and with slight apprehension, called to meet one of the prospecting candidates. Hmm. And let the fascist lamp continue to shine in a fountain. The experienced hand of Butler will see Britain through. And I think I read this one as well, so... Um... If you want to read this one, please go ahead. I think I read this one. Yeah. The speakers. In the great game of British politics, sometimes one only needs a stage and a microphone to radically change our political climate. Thus, with the BPP conference coming up, the opportunity to give the opening speech of the conference the chance to set the agenda of the BPP for the future is a highly envied and sought after position. For this position, there are two clear candidates for the speech, Rob Butler and Andrew Fontaine. But this are the position. For a chance to showcase the superiority of the position, yet only one will have the opportunity to make their mark on the party and with it, Britain itself. Uh, one comment from yesterday said was, uh, British fascism is like German national socialism, except they don't have minorities to purge. Fantastic. Automatic, automatic, automatic support. Wins. Wow, we are really freaking far behind, aren't we? Oh my god, I didn't realize how far behind we were. And what to do with Wilson versus a seat for Jordan? With the death of the old Britain amongst the blood of sea lime, Britain was reborn, yet with its rebirth, so followed some remnants of the old order who remained devoted to the service of Britannia, willing to aid us in the building of Britain once more. Among these individuals, there's one man who stands out, one man who is seen as a snake by even the pragmatist, Harold Wilson. Wilson, since the end of World War II, has rapidly risen through our government, fulfilling each job assigned to him with extreme competence, yet, unlike so many of his contemporaries, Wilson's motives remain a mystery even to this day, Butler himself even viewing him with mistrust. With the BBP conference coming up, we shall have to decide whether to aid in his rise or crush a snake under our heel. And of course, we're still dealing with all this. We have 37% resistance, or oh, that's not good. Oh God, where is it at right now? 40%, so we don't increase it anymore. Um, so we went m minus 15 up to the previous chaos threshold, which was um, up here, which I'm not sure how much it didn't say. So, uh, so we want to do that at least before we do anything else here, because uh, we don't, do not want to increase chaos any higher or further. Oh god, it actually might get higher and further. Oh god dang it. How many days does this one take? 14 days? Uh, do that one anyways. Yeah. Because this will click on... Oh, we might actually get a 40... Oh, that's not good. That's actually really bad. Oh god. 
Well, we're here to see what happens. Who shall eat? <coughs> nice. Ah, who shall eat? You see the crisis. Ah, yes, the opening speech of the annual BPP conference. Arguably one of the most defining moments of the conference, it's a grandiose and rousing call to action made by the enraptured membership every year. Due to the significance of the event, the position of speaker is an enviable one. Indeed, it leaves the speaker with a great deal of both personal prestige and political capital afterwards. This year, the two main contenders for the position are the two strongmen of the party politics. Rap Butler, out of the pragmatist faction, and Andrew Fountaine for the ideologies, or ideologues. Whichever the two makes a speech, their respective faction will surely be empowered. Who shall we be? Butler shall do? Fountaine? Nah, we're gonna go the, that Butler route. Oh god. Oh, they get more influence over everybody, huh? God dang, we don't want 40. Civil rights, huh? What about civil wrongs? A seat for Jordan? Amongst the defenders of a government, the British Free Corps are perhaps the most understood element in our armed forces. The BFC and its political sympathizers, the spearhead group, can be best personified as the attack dog of our government, ruthlessly and effectively removing the rot in our society, tearing at the roots of the resistance. At the head of the organization stands Thomas Holler Cooper, who has Davos devoutly worked to destroy the resistance and keep the UK in the loving arms of the Fuhrer. Yet many of the moderate elements of the BPP see Jordan as more of a hindrance to our reconstruction than a help, arguing he's nothing more than a rabid attack dog who can barely tell friend or foe. So should we listen to the ideologues and allow Jordan and a voice of the conference to relieve Jordan and the BFC behind the chaos of the 50s? The sleeper awakes. Below the chandeliers between the candles, before the portraits of British heroes, the old guard gathered for a pity party. Hastings Russell, the party's host, called for more wine to be poured into cups, a.k.a. Chesterton would have kept the servants occupied had the host not issued orders to pace his drinks. No orders regarding Jane Birdwood were given, who fell deep into her cup and refused to crawl out. Next door was Gerard Wallop, uh, stone sober and suffering the misery of his peers. Though they were spending the night in the Lord Hastings' country manor, the troubles of London clung to them like tapeworms, so dear they said. Butler and Fontaine have made a mess of things. They spoke of the endless arguments between the two, while government business subsumed into this feud beneath the pity was a slurry of emotions, fear, confusion, above all, rage. Wallop felt that the last one acutely, though duty bounded it in Aya. But as the dessert tray passed with, by with the teas and cakes, an offhand comment by Bird would compare to this to Prince Prospero's ball set him off. Ladies and gentlemen, he said, in sudden rise, halting all conversation, we are representatives of a British government that has suffered great indignities. We've gone unheard, ignored, and insulted. In our absence, another civil war has erupted in Westminster and Whitehall. It is a subtler, crueler one, fought between boorish thugs drunk on grandeur and snubbling paper pushers with hidden sympathies, and it'll destroy us if we let it, leave it unchecked. Many of you sought my nomination for our Prime Minister, and I rejected these calls on the grounds that I believed it improper. Now I see no other choice but to seek that very office and put an end to the madness that Fountaine and Butler have unleashed. We... No longer have the privilege of standing by and waiting for this fire to burn out of its own. We have suffered too much to let another civil war tear our country apart. A chorus of fear here, a round of applause, and all present that night lined up behind Lord Portsmouth. White blankets. Grab open his coal box in desperation. A feeble attempt, oh god, to scavenge whatever remained of the coal, which he had bought two weeks ago with his pensions, only barely, barely being able to afford a week's worth since the uh, price of skyrocketed. He grinned in frustration as he found nothing but fine black powder, extinguishing all hopes of eating his home. He knew that he had to make do, but his main concern was his wife, Margaret Shriving had shriveling or shivering had intensified. These past few days, despite his efforts to keep her wrapped up, disappointed, the pensioner started his trek to the bedroom to join his wife. The loss in sensation and the extremities made navigating the home a daunting task, and the feeble man had avoided a close shave when he nearly tripped on the stairs. Finally, under wraps, the layers of blankets did not to stop the bitter cold from biting into Graham's old frail bones. The freezing man looked at his wife. The sight of her pale face and shaking body filled him with a deep sense of inadequacy. She stood by him, through thick and thin, and he, all his life, yet he could do nothing but help her. Nothing do, could do nothing to help her. The husband reached out to hold his hands, wife's hand, yet it was as if he was holding by bony icicles. I'm sorry, dear. I'm so sorry that I couldn't keep you warm, he mumbled, mumbled to his wife, unable to expend the energy to speak any louder. After several moments, she finally whispered back, there's no need to say sorry, this will pass. I shall always thank God for all you've done. They both exchanged one final glance into each other's eyes before finally succumbing to the cold. Frozen hearts. The spring winds blow across lifeless fields. Snap breeze in the UK kills hundreds. What am I supposed to do here? I, I maxed it out as much as I could. Inflation's at least here. Oh god. 5.2% growth? Jesus. There's nothing we could have done. Snap. Freeze in UK kills hundreds. A cold snap brought on by a mixture of Russian and Scandinavian winds has spelled disaster for Britain. The most recent winter has claimed the mantle of being the coldest winter season the nation has faced in recorded history. Beginning with a series of cold fronts moved across the Isles alongside gale force winds in mid-December, temperatures drop as low as negative 22 degrees. Celsius, oh, uh, 22 degrees Celsius in areas such as Bremer. While current reports are unsure of the number of fatalities, internal government leaks mention that 283 workers died in the civil parish of the Filingsdale alone. 
Germany and America have indicated that no immediate help will come from either country, leaving the British government to manage the crisis alone. Given the inaction from the government, many across the nation fear for what may sh should, uh, what may happen should another deadly winter come. Now is the winter of our discontent, and what to do with Wilson? Among the great political players of the BPP, the word snake is an all too common insult for one's political opponents. Yet few were called snake by members of their own faction, and for one notable BPP member, it has transformed into an all too common nickname, Mr. Harold Wilson of the Pragmatists. Yet as Donville observed as he read through the suggested speakers for the BPP conference, his reputation did not even seem to have deterred Wilson's rise considering his suggested role in the conference. Reading on in his history, Wilson has seemingly been a civil servant during the war, serving with great distinction, supposedly writing half of a beverage report himself, even with his invasion. Wilson stated low becoming a key figure in the reconstruction of the civil service, eventually becoming an MP in the 50s, but even with his work, not much is known on Wilson's own beliefs beyond his support for Keynesian economics. It is perhaps because of this he has been christened as Snake. Yet as Donville looked back to the report, he is still conflicted on Wilson's role in conferences. For the conference, Wilson was an efficient, seemingly loyal public servant, dutifully acting in Britain's best interests, working to help reconstruct Britain from the misery of the 40s, yet Wilson was on a soul unpredictable. Mistrusted even by Butler, and they were to promote Wilson just because he's the best person for the job, it was created a lot of resentment through the whole of uh, the civil service and within the BBP. With all this in mind, with a tinge of apprehension, Dampa finally decided upon the fate of Wilson. Let the snake speak, keep him muzzled. Well, I'd say for us, we got goals here. Um, and we don't really, I don't think we can get Wilson, can we? Does it matter if we get Wilson or not? Well, I think what we should do is let him speak. The proper sort. So I said, Oswald, is that you? And he looked like I'd slapped him. Laughter erupted as the Lady Birdwald finished her joke, mocking the rivals always went down well with the old guard. And at a time like this, only hit harder surrounded by their wealth and power. These parties were the lifeblood in more ways than one, integral for the intricate system of patronage court of the faction self, but also a nostalgic display of Britain's glory days. Here in those gilded halls, a fantasy of a fascist empire ruling the waves in perpetuity seemed almost real enough to hold. Rifting deftly through the crowd, Lady Birdwood soon caught sight of her target, the Foreign Secretary Ronald Nile Kane, second Baron Brockett. Her fellow cabinet member was deep in conversation with a pair of bench, backbench MPs who she recognized as old ministers from Chesterton's ill-fated ministry. Nothing too important, she would, uh, would be interrupting them. Ronald, I didn't know you were coming tonight, it's like you practically live in the foreign office these days, she said. Nile Kane smiled, informing her she'd been correcting and assessing the importance of the previous conversation. Lady Birdwood. Always delightful to see you outside of work. I do apologize for being so up tied up in things lately. Barry's taking the recent attacks very seriously and has me consist in constant meetings with her German friends on security matters. Not to mention Gerard's agitating about the mega corporations again, he replied, picking a glass of champagne off a roving tray. Does he now? Well, after what's happened to poor old Arthur, I think it's quite right we bring in the experts to deal with those traitorous cockroaches. We don't hear of uprisings in the Reich, that's for sure. And so the conversations went on. The participants happily secluded from the country they governed and ignorant to the reality before them. Celebrating away the evenings as they'd done for the past 20 years. Like Nero once fiddled as Rome burned, they instead toasted. Oh, tomorrow's parties. Since the end of the Second World War, the British People's Party has possessed a stranglehold of power, dominating every aspect of political life in Britain. It is for this reason that the BPP's conference is perhaps the most important political event of the year. In order to have a successful event that showcases the might and success of the BPP, we must start organizing it soon. Preparation for such an event is vital, as it indicates that not just the BPP's strength, but all of Britain's strength as well. Ah, good job in Malaya. Is he doomed to follow in the steps of Bukharan? Well, we'll see. But very good so far. <clears throat> so we're 27%. We continually take these, which makes sense. Well, it goes down to the previous threshold. Um, weekly influence, though, uh, the ideologues get more now. We have 3.3% growth, 2.7% inflation, which is not bad, actually. We have US plus of 6.34 billion. Um, debt GDP ratio is 41%, which is not bad. So overall, we're doing quite well, I'd say. Our intermediate uh, level for our, fiscal, our credit rating, not bad. Um, as long as Germany doesn't explode later on this year, I think we should be okay. I'll see for the future. Donald can never really <clears throat> speak ill of the Germans, for it was the Germans who had brought this new better Britain, one uncorrupted by Bolshevism and a liberalism. Hitler may have made his own small little mistakes, but his role in saving Britain cannot be forgotten, his great achievements never understated. Yet every time he read a report on Halle Cooper, head of the illustrious British Free Corps, he couldn't help but curse him for forcing him to deal with antics. Jordan had been in power for as long as Donville had, rising with the BP BFC due to the ferocity and efficiency of dealing with Sterling's revolts in the 50s. He'd even end up replacing Amory as the head of the BFC drunkard that he was after his incompetence of managing the force was revealed. Heck, according to some, it was Jordan's own squad that finally slid their demonic Sterling and brought on to an end to those dark years. 
And now, Jordan still remains one of the most powerful and controversial figures in Britain, to some a proud representative of a strong Aryan fighting for both the Reich and the United Kingdom. To others, he's a madman, carelessly murdering innocents on his own wild goose chases. He's best summarized as, in the words of one unnamed MP, really effing insane. And the dumbbell, he's a massive headache. He can be placed as speaker the, at the BBP conference, which would be a clear show of recon recognition for his efforts, or we could just reject him and give a clear repudi repudiation of his efforts. We could perhaps allow one of his moderates to represent him for the party, but I suppose it would be difficult. Like asking which lunatic should run the asylum. In the end, it's up to Dumbo to do what he thinks best. So, hmm. Let the Batman in. So, we want this guy, huh? Do we want him? Do we not want him? Well, I don't know if we really want him or not. He's a bit insane. Jordan, huh? Not Colin Jordan, is he? Yeah. Hmm. Ah, I'll keep him Because we can. Yeah. <clears throat> the BBB Conference of 1963. The days are here, and it's time to gather in the Blackpool and have a part conference. Since the great political shift of the economy of the invasion, our party has been a grand coalition of collaborators banded together to rebuild Britain from the devastation of the previous governments. Our leaders have walked a tightrope, balancing the desires of both the party, yet such an exercise cannot be sustained forever. Um, and it is within this conference that the rivalry should be put to an end. It shall be the Blackpool. And in Blackpool, the future of our party shall be decided, be it with ideologues of Fountain or pragmatists of Butler. And this conference is the future leadership of our party, and with it, the British people will be decided. That is, if our government does not fall to the other forces first. Twenty-six percent is not terrible. It's looking better already. Forty point three percent, not bad. Three point two percent is not as good. Inflation is slowly getting higher too now, which is not ideal, but whatever. Hello, what is that? Oh, it's all this stuff up there too. <coughs> Excuse me. The army issue. Ever since their surrender, our military has been reduced to a ceremonial vis vestige. Our once vast armed forces were forced to rely on the German garrison. The garrison, for 20 years, 20 long years, has acted as the backbone and sole means of securing a government's existence. <coughs> Yet in recent years, the status of our armed forces has come once more into question. On one hand, some argue that the status quo is acceptable for the time being. Other, more pressing issues require our attention. On the other hand, others argue that for our regime to finally be seen as legitimate and to regain the trust of the British public, it's necessary for armed forces to once again stand on its own without the assistance of our benefactors. Regardless of the opinions of the various factions and individuals on the issue, it is true that the matter of our army needs to be settled, and soon. Ah, oh, good old Kemerovo, huh? Very, very nice. And we have a cup of white tea here to keep us nice and satisfied. The inevitable procession continuation is one of the more uh, fundamental mores that make Britain what it is, a sensible governance preserved and finessed through generations like the world's finest sculpture. Britain is a birthplace of democracy, brought about not through the fires of a revolution, but by reform bit by bit over time. A law is formed not from any single document, but formed over thousands of years of experience. It is that tradition that is celebrated today, as Butler delivers his speech to the rapturous applause, Fountaine and his smallest coterie silently see that the sight. They tell him to speak, of course, but their speeches were only politely given their due attention and applause. Those men didn't even say anything particularly remarkable, only reaffirming the previous beliefs of the pragmatists filled with corrupt officials, snakes, and moderates. And yet, evidently, the motley band in a den of corruption had struck out the fanatics. Their fiery rhetoric and calls for national renewal fall in deaf ears. And why would they not? Britain was doing remarkably well in a downville. It was only natural that policy would be outstretched as a continuation of his dealings, and that meant doing the sensible thing. Butler was finishing up his particular speech, Britain carries with it a standard to uphold. Behind us lays more than a thousand years of good governance, let us toast to a thousand years more. The room thundered with applause, drowning out even the loudest grumblings. Sensible progress will always win out over f emotional fronts. Oh, oh crap. Amazing. Uh, we're find the armed forces. Uh, well, we'll probably need to do that. Oh, we spend more money? Oh god, no. Oh god. Uh, support forces, Gerson. 
Well, not too long ago, Brother Tanya's armed forces stood above all others, sneering at all those who tried to replicate its glory. Our army standing proud from the Cape to Bengal, our navy ruling the waves, yet even with their might and resources, Britannia fell, with the army crumpling under the weight of the Wehrmacht. But despite this, in the light of the new order, our military can be rebuilt stronger and sturdier than ever it was before. This new army shall be reborn, crafted with the spirit of the old and the ideals of the new order, trained with superior arms and molded into the face of safety against the ever gnawing resistance in the eyes of the people. No longer shall we be dependent on our benefactors, no. Britain and soldiers may no longer patrol the vast corners of the world, but we can keep the home isle safe. Eh, yeah, not as much. It's still going up. And GDP is going up too, which is nice. And debt to GDP ratio is improving as well, which is good. Okay, we got more research to do. Uh, improved infantry rifles, yes please. Ah, the advancement of British technology, which is still behind everybody else, but whatever. The Kitchener's Spectre. Um, a Belkin had gone to town to get angry. He had only come out of his bungalow to help his daughter, Mage, with just shopping. She protested, of course, but she really didn't excuse to work his old bones, mind you. He was hardly a spring chicken at the ripe old age of uh, 72. Uh, but it was better than sitting around all day. Mage had just finished telling about how his second granddaughter had just gotten engaged to a nice lad from Liverpool when Bill heard a loud voice echoing from the town square. Young lads of Britain, are you tired of your average lives? Would you like to serve your country? Then come on over here and sign up on the British Army. We want you. A middle-aged man with a graying dark hair and a pencil-thin mustache was handing out leaflets and blazing with what looked to be a bastard at a version of Lord Kitchener in a German army uniform. Beside him sat a rather severe-looking man. At the table was taking down the names of what Bill found to be the most offensive part of the display. A queue of young men who were cluelessly signed up. Or signing up. Major had long since known when to pick on her father's mannerisms, swiftly moved to try and assuage him. Dad, come on, it's not worth getting all worked up about. Bill scoffed. I feel however I bloody well pleased, Mage. Bloody disgraceful. Don't them lads know who they're really signing up to fight for? She rolled her eyes. You were in the army for both wars. There's no point getting all angry about it. Bill felt his wizened fist clench. I was all right. Fighting against the bloody fascist scum that they're about to sign up for. Where's the fight in them? Don't they even care about what we fought for? Mage sighed and shook her head. Come on, Dad, chops this way. And the two walked past the recruiter, but not before the old soldier shot in an utterly poisonous look at the man in the square. When they come for the young, it's all over. Concessions to the garrison. In our effort to create a more independent British army, one capable of protecting Britain and keeping it stable all on its own, we mustn't forget the German garrison, whose long devout service had kept Britain from falling to chaos for 20 years. For it was only thanks to their tireless work in looking after security within Britain that we were able to focus our efforts on reconstruction and fixing our broken nation. It's only thanks to them keeping Britain safe and secure for so long that we have the opportunity to create an independent army, therefore a memorial of the tireless work to keep Britain safe which will give some concessions and ensure their support in creating a more independent Britain. Okay. Oh, we're down to 20. Look at that. Fantastic. No more chaos. Yeah, it's gonna hurt us a little bit, whatever. It's alright. It's all good. Yeah, the peepee to spend. Pulling yourself on the line. When Ben told his mother of his intention to join the army, a flurry of emotion swam through her eyes. Shock, fear, and sadness were all visible before they finally settled on anger. His face was met with a slap sh uh, sharp slap. What the heck do you think you're do talking about, you stupid boy? She shouted. You can't join the bloody military. You're barely out, for s out of school, for goodness sakes. Knocked off kilter by the unexpected smack, Ben quickly snapped back. Oh, and I'm old enough to work at some dingy old factory all the day, am I? At least this way I'm not wasting my life and I'm actually doing something for once. She scoffed, folding her arms. A waste of a life, eh? Is it? Is that what you think about your dad? Did he waste his life then? Silence fell over the mother and son, as the unspoken presence of the missing family member made no itself known. She put her hands over her eyes and began to sob gently. Not you too, Ben. I can't lose you too. I just can't. There goes inflation. Uh, Ben's expression softened, and then he pulled his mother into a firm hug. Mom, I'll swear I'll be back, I promise you, he said, loudly patting her on the back. I'm going to come back home and we'll be much better off, all right? She could only sniffle in response, regardless he already signed up. He was due to be heading to basic training in a few days. All birds do leave the nest, eventually. And of course, no longer a sidekick. The British Army should have never been made subordinate to the garrison. Whilst we appreciate the input from our friends in Germania, it will be frankly insulting for the military of one sovereign nation to be dominated by that of another. The army shall be its own entity once more, able to take its own action against the resistance without following the demands of the garrison for king and country. Uh, at least to the wild dog. Furthermore, oh, report. We come to the report of the BFC activities this month, then this offers an opportunity to look at the Hollow Cooper's actual value as an anti-partisan. Hollow Cooper. Based on information gathered by agents in the Glasgow area, uh, launched a raid on the so-called Sons of Wallace rebel group, burning their hideout to the ground and seemingly murdering their inhabitants. This fire would later spread, burning down a restaurant nearby, while the resistance cells dead were no longer closer to finding that they were acting independently or part of the larger origin or of the larger origination. Activities like these and its continual collateral damage led me to suggest once more to reduce Jordan's role in dealing with the resistance activity. 
upon finishing the reading of the summary report. Dombell looked up to the knight. Max, well, I've read this kind of report a hundred times before. You know we can't get rid of Jordan. He may be over on the brute force, but it's certainly not only dedicated to wiping out the resistance. He's also one of our best connections to our friends in the pact, which we need in such dangerous times. After a quick reflection and a short sigh, Maxwell replied, I'm more aware he's liked by some in Germanium, especially within the SS. But his methods do more harm than good. He's making my life and the lives of our agents harder than the brutality only makes us the population fear us more. Now, I know you don't like him, Don Bell said, but he's one of the men standing up against the hordes that are trying to break Britain. I need every hand on deck in dealing with such a threat, Maxwell stayed telling for a minute before responding carefully. Sir, if I may be so bold, the members of our security service did the most work here. Uh, Jordan merely finished the operation in a rather poor way. Don Bell stood up, guiding Maxwell toward the door. Of course, my friend, we cannot overlook such a brave man, especially when Britain finds itself in such a precarious state. I'll pass on your advice to Jordan and tell him to be careful in the future. Uh, we're all on the same side here, are after all, fighting for king and country. Of course, Perry. For a king and country. Of course. Yeah, growth has slowed down too. Not good. Uh, where are we at with this? Hey, seven uh, barrage is almost done too. Economy. Let's not talk about the economy. It's not looking good for us right now. Um, employment. Unemployment's actually getting better. Growth has hit the hit the bed. I pooped the bed. Inflation. Uh, it is what it is. No longer psychic. Tame Real Britain. Upon seeing the dreaded Marcus that infests the left resistance, one might be eager to crush their forces, to destroy the par parasite eating away at Britannia. Yet we must not let our emotions guide us, for it is not in the cities where the war will be won. It's in the countryside where the struggle will be concluded, where our seemingly endless battle with the resistance will finally be ended. For if we destroy the SOE, the resistance will be left trapped within the cities. Their lines of communication shattered and their only professional army dead. From there, uh, we can choke out the left resistance, drive them out in the open, and wipe them out once and, of course, for all. Hey, that's better growth. That's getting a little better. And that GDP ratio, we're, we're making headway. We are making headway, my friends. 25%, still not bad. Oh, it's all this. Ideologues. Pragmatists. Despotism. A lot of money. The search for the terrible twins drags on. Despite our reforms, despite all our efforts, despite all our advantages, the terrible twins still continue to evade us, escaping time and time again. Each time we come closer and closer to finally catching and hanging the traitors, yet each time they escape, vanishing into the night like ghosts. Each time they vanish, we start the search again, yet the ending remains the same. Is it traitors? Is it incompetence? Is it simply just bad luck? Only God knows, and he certainly isn't on our side in recent years. But we must push on, begin the chase again, or else they will seize upon this opportunity to wreck our beloved nation. But how long can this endless chase last for? Not forever, mind you. Hey, not bad. Okay, way worse now. Whatever. 30% is okay. Keep doing that one, though. Down in the countryside. So, Mr. Stewart, you're absolutely sure that you've seen none of this lot around? The wizard of a farmer simply shook his head once more. Narp, uh, I haven't seen none of them sort of around here. The Frank felt his patience was growing shorter by the second. He had brought the entire platoon of his soldiers out with him because they had received rock solid information that the SOE operatives had been around seeing this small village. All week they had been searching the place top to bottom, going door to door and questioning the locals, and yet they had been met with no results. Um, he glanced behind him. A bunch of tired, restless, and rowdy soldiers met his gaze. Even by some miracle they did find out where the SOE had scuttled off to, or scurried off to, there was no way that this slovenly lot would be able to make, take that battle hard in partisans. Looking back to the old man, he shook his head. Well, all right then, sir, be sure to report any suspicious activity to the police, uh, if you see it. Thank you for your time. The old man nodded and went back inside. Frank turned back around to his platoon, raising his voice. All right, lads, we, did catch him. we didn't catch him today, but they can't hide forever. Back to HQ, quick march. And thus the soldiers marched back to the base. Through the window. Davy Stewart watched the soldiers march off, unbeknownst to them. He waited a few minutes until he was entirely sure that they would not be back. He slowly crept out of his house, walking over to the barn that stood behind his small cottage. 
He wrapped his knuckles twice against the door and opened it, craning his head inside. Although the barn itself was dark, the small ray of sunlight that escaped in through this cracked door illuminated the many SOE members that had been hiding within it. The old man couldn't help us murk. Ghost is clear now, lads. Optics and activity. Though that we have made immense progress over the past decades, and especially in the last few years, the resistance continues to plague Britain, inspiring crime and disorder across the realm. Many of the intergovernment have offered solutions on how to fix this issue, bringing peace to the land. Each of these have their own strengths and weaknesses, and it's up to us to choose one of their methods, and ensure that in a decade the resistance will be just a fleeting memory. The resistance's reign of terror must end unless they cause further damage. Oh boy. Come on. Why did it reduce it? That makes literally no sense. Bruh. That is oh dumb. That's so stupid. Sometimes it doesn't work, it's bugged. Or I guess maybe it's not bugged and you have to wait. So we spent all that political power for nothing. That's 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 not cool. That's really not cool. Like this should happen immediately when this happens. You can't keep getting away with it though. Failure is not something Barry Dombo was unfamiliar with. When involved in the wild goose chase, I was trying to capture Fitzroy McLean and Jack Jones, after all. It was a con constant companion. The Prime Minister found himself growing more and more tense as he flicked through a stack of reports on the status of the two partisans. Again and again, he read the same result. Total failure. He threw the stack of papers onto the desk and groaned, burying his head in his hands. On how on God's green earth did a deranged Scotsman and a puffed-up Union boss manage to evade them all in such a way? Down but said his best man upon them and still couldn't have came back empty-handed. He was at a loss. One would think they knew something that the government did not. Suddenly an awful thought came to his mind, his eyes widened, no, couldn't be possible. The party had faced instability before, but never on the scale. He shakily picked up the reports and kept looking um, through them all. The one unifying factor that ran through them all was that the twins always knew when and where their troops were coming. Jones ambushed patrols, McLean leaving a bomb behind in the barn that was said to be hiding in. A cold shiver ran down his spine, there was no other way. Someone in the government had to be working against him, but who? Who would do such a thing? His thoughts were interrupted by two sharp knocks on the door. He snapped out of his state, come in, he barked, trying to hide the panic that he had been feeling from whoever was outside. Through the oaken doors came Maxwell and Nag clutching a pile of manila folders. Good evening, Prime Minister. The latest lo loaded reports on the twins, he said, nodding at the pile. Oh, yes, very good. Just drop them on here, Maxwell, he murmured. As Matt pulled the files down, Dumbo placed his hand on his wrist. Now looked up at him quizzically. A moment passed. Maxwell, as someone with a background in espionage, I want your honest opinion. Do you think anyone in the cabinet would betray us to the twins? For the briefest of moments, something indiscernible flashed across the night's face, and then he responded, I can say with confidence, Prime Minister, that I know nobody who would. Hmm. Hmm, not peculiar from that man, eh? Quite peculiar. Things happen across the world. Looking pretty good. Dominican Republic. Ah, uh, tricky dick. Nothing like tricky dick. And... Is this the part where we just kind of hang out? Oh, parts of these areas are uh, now demilitarized. Memorial of a tyrant. Hitler is dead. Oh, boy. Uh, Dumbo did not take the news well. As it said it walked for an hour before leaving the study to give an official statement to the press. To Dumbo, Hitler may not have been perfect, but as a savior of Europe and the liberator of Britain. And once they're all faded, fears crept in without him what was to become of the Reich and what was to become of Britannia. De Fontaine. The news was deeply sorrowful, and for one of humanity's greatest minds, it was lost to us. Hitler um, had liberated Europe and allowed the greatest members of British society to rise unrestricted by old morals. Yet beyond this, Fontaine was more concerned for Britain itself. Without his great benefactor, what was to become of the BPP in Britain? How was the new order able to survive without his greatest champion? For Wallop and all the great lords of the BPP. The news brought upon them fear, overwhelming fear for the future. For now, though their opinions on Hitler varied, and the support for national socialism was minimal, Hitler brought back one thing for them, power, power over the great masses of Britain. Well, Hitler's eternal support, the death of Hitler may not just be a death blow for the Reich, but for the whole dynasties of Britain as well. And Butler, he gave his deepest regards to the German minister, and gave a tearful address to the press. Yet Butler felt no sadness for Hitler. Oh, Butler felt fear, fear for the stability of Britain and the collapse of the economy. Fear for his own personal future. Yet beyond his false sorrow and fears for the future of Britain, Butler felt a tinge of glee of happiness for the tyrant who destroyed the Britain he loved. And for, for the public, the great subjugator is dead and the future of Britannia lies in flux. Britain returns once more to chaos and ding dong. It was a rainy day when Emma and Elizabeth found out that Hitler had died. They had been hiding away in the old cigarette factory for weeks after being pursued by police. It was cold. Beyond that, the makeshift bedding they had established with the other resistance members on the upper floors made for a surprisingly comfortable living situation. Emma, Elizabeth, and old Bill were sitting together, and Bill was telling them about one of his war stories. I escaped certain death in the trenches with a psalm using only some rope and a pair of old leather boots. All of a sudden, however, Bobby jumped into the room with a look of glee on his face. He's dead! The young man yelled, he's finally gone and corked it. 
Everyone was still on for a moment, they would know who he would be. Who else? It was Hitler. Hitler, Adolf, had finally died. And was the first to say anything, he's, he's really gone? The bastard is gone? Bobby nodded. Elizabeth slammed her head on her hand, uh, onto her mouth, stiffing a back a sob of joy. He's gone, he's gone. She stood up laughing, he's gone. The bastard's dead, he's stupidly dead. Burn and heck, wanker. At this point, Elizabeth stood up and hugged her partner, and they began to jump for joy together, giddying, giggling ecstatically. How about that, Bell? Do you reckon he sh pooped himself? Or that it hurt? It better blood it hurt, I'd say. Bell didn't respond, looking on with a thin smile. It was a relief to see him dead, of course, but it wouldn't bring his comrades back from the dead. And uh, as he saw the two girls and that other boy celebrating his death, old Bell couldn't help but wonder one thing. How many people like them will be lost in what's to come? Germany and chaos. Hitler is dead. As we've probably established for the last five minutes. Those three words have sent uh, an entire continent into a state of paralysis. The Reich itself is stuck at a political standstill. As the status quo is torn asunder. Regardless of one of the personal feelings towards the man, the vacuum left by his death will doubtlessly send all of Europe into shock. Uh, as one of the states aligned with the Reich, uh, it is inevitable that we will too not be spared from the incoming chaos. The economic impacts alone of Hitler's death are going to be catastrophic. Already reports are coming in of economists and representatives from the mega corporations panicking and withdrawing their stock. The great storm consuming all of Europe seems to be about to break and draws ever closer to Albion's shores. Oh, good God. I'm glad we got the chaos down for now. And we're looking decent over there, too. Declare support Hitler's successor. It seems as if nobody who truly could replace Adolf Hitler in the hearts of both Germans and indeed fascists all over the world. Uh, love him or hate him, the impact he has had upon both the Reich and his territories cannot be overstated, nonetheless. While he indeed stood as large as a titan, he was a man nonetheless. And the sake for stability, however, we must acknowledge this. The sooner the Reich is stable, the sooner we can return to business as usual. Um, Whoever has chosen to succeed Hitler will be granted our unconditional support regardless of whatever we feel about them. A united cabinet of fools. It's been a long time since the cabinet gathered with much speed and desperation, and not since the 50s, when it seemed the entire government was close to collapsing within itself. Now, it seemed that the BPP faced the same crisis, with the German masters in such a disarray and resistance stirring once more. Of course, the first agenda, and the sole reason most of them were there, was a matter of German succession. Following, at dawn those own request, a, minute, a minute of silence for the former Fuhrer. The cabinet moved on, who should recognize as a new Fuhrer, the new master of Europe. Though there were a few uh, m uh, minutes to dispute, arguing over legitimacy and who was the best of Britain, it was eventually decided to ultimately support the chosen successor, uh, for at least with him, there was a chance stability may return at home. Had a few more minor problems, such as attempting to stop the British economy from collapsing, the meeting was adjourned, each cabinet member scampering off to their own little holes. As they left, Donald could only look to his hands, which hadn't stopped shaking since he'd heard of the news of Hitler's death. Despite his uncertainty, despite his fear, he knew that he must remain strong, that he must keep Britain united no matter the cost, or the BPP was to be laid waste by the flames of the revolution, as the old order was 20 years ago. A final show of respect to the old Fuhrer. Enacting emergency measures. Despite the passage of the Freedom of Security Act, Hitler's death means that the resistance will be emboldened, and thus we must redouble our efforts. We must not only expand our use of the FSA, but also implement martial law, impose heavy curfews, and curb any snip of radical behavior. Unfortunately, the increased threat means we'll have to turn to the British Free Corps and Holler at Cooper. However, it may as flaws may be, Jordan is dedicated to helping protect our new government, and we need him now more than ever. Some may consider the use of the BFC alongside regular police extreme, but it must be done lest we fail to, uh, fall to complete chaos. Um, this one. It's temporarily closed as the London Stock Exchange with the fall of the Fuhrer. It seems that the German economy is falling with them, the pact economically and politically is collapsing around them, and it seems that our economy is following suit. With the insecurity and instability sweeping across Europe, the mega corporations that our economy so relies upon is designed to begin pulling out of Britain. Well, we won't let them run far. With these developments, Brothers has also recommended that the London Stock Exchange be contemporarily closed. They cancel trading in an order to prevent a forex run. From this, we can begin to stabilize our economy and ensure that it does not revert back to the state it was once in post-war. And everyone's killing themselves. Yay! Meet with the Wiesenmeier. Edmund Wiesenmeier is a reasonable man, a soldier, a diplomat, a skilled negotiator. He has helped many... Many, mediate many a dialogue between us and our friends in the garrison, and indeed, the wider Reich on the whole. If there's every single man who can understand the struggles that we're going through as of now, it is him. Thus, we will approach him and ask him to remember that all he's done for us thus far and what he can continue to help us with. Our position uh, would be much weaker without him, uh, which is something we cannot afford. Oh, there's actually an event for Hungary. Go freaking figure. Finally, the Hungarians can do something. You're welcome, Hungary. I did not help you. An abnormal day in Wall Street. For 20 long years, the street of the London stock market had never been particularly busy, until the pavements barren of the masses that once filled it. The street had taken a few years to rebuild from the straight artillery shell during sea line, and its many businesses either being German-owned, struggling, or closed. Despite all this, in his 10 years of working there, Harold cannot remember a day when he'd see the streets avoid of all bystanders. On approaching the building, they first noticed that most of the building was boarded up, its windows covered in steel and wood. The main door had a barricade set up around it, hastily built of tables and chairs from within the building, barbed wire dotted around it. 
Strange thing, how was, however, was the barricade at the front was seemingly half done. With a human sized hole offering an entrance into the building, which Harold, with some perturbation, moved into the building through. Inside, Harold found the building in a dilapidated, delperated state, chairs and tables dotting around the room in the bare state to disrepair. Papers were strewn about, a few evidently torn out, while most were just left on the floor or desks. Yet the most notable and out of place sight in the large room was a rather large number of men and women, the weapons of mismatched German, American, and even old British rifles from the war. As Harold stepped closer, he noticed, as more and more heads turned to face him, the youngest one who could, could be more than 16, but their old battered gun on him, seemingly anxious to shoot. But then the oldest man in his late 60s turned to him, offering a small smile before asking him, You here to join the revolution then? Discuss a garrison situation. Now we're certain that Vissimaya and the Wehrmacht are staying to help us in defeating the resistance. Our proud German allies know that to lose us as allies to, to the Judeo Bolsheviks and the American backers is a lot of the snake that is liberalism to creep back into the new order. With this professional German army, we have a large advantage over the disunited militia forces of the resistance. Yet, if you do not seize the opportunity now, a great advantage will be lost, and thus we must move to deploy the garrison to unruly areas and crush a potential revolution before it even begins. Cool. A plea to the Reich. To see Prime Minister or the representative of the German Reich have been a rather common occurrence in the last 20 years of the collaborationist government. And yet, for not some time, had the Prime Minister run into the German embassy with such speed and such desperation. Almost 10 minutes after Domville's hasty entrance into the building, Domville finally met, met Wiesemeyer for tea, sweat visible on his face before Domville could start politely begging him to stay, pleading with him to remain to keep Britain from falling to chaos, Wiesemeyer spoke up. Domville, in light of the instability both within Britain and the Reich, I've been instructed to remain in Britain until the situation here at home passes. In the effort, the German garrison will remain in Britain and keep order and security whatever the cost. In response, Domville could only splutter out thanks quickly and praise for the wisdom of the German Reich. Given silent thanks to God for his obvious generosity, following further discussions on the nature of cooperation between German and first, uh, British forces, it was eventually decided that the German garrison should be temporarily integrated with the British uh, High Command in order to ensure a coercive, efficient military. Before he left, a sweat streaking down his face, Wiesemeyer gave a final word of warning. I may not be able to save all the Reichs from anarchy, but this island will hold, no matter how much blood is required to do so. One step closer to chaos. Knight's sit rep. With all the bad news that His Majesty's government has been inundated with, it's time to ensure that the biggest thorns in her side are dealt with. As such, we will ask our most loyal ally, Maxwell Knight, to look into the resistance and the recent activity. I would also, of course, ask for suggestions on how to crush these bloody traitors, be they a mad Scotsman or a foolish a unionist. Uh-huh. Uh, invoke state, state siege measures. While Germany burns and German power shrinks across Europe, it would be a foolish to think that the degenerates who seek to undermine the new order would not come to tear down what they've spent so hard to build. Not only do we have fear of the enemies from within, we must all be wary of foreign rivalries to the West. From the corrupted IR to the elder son in America, our enemies are numerous and strong, yet a new state is strong enough to hold against such hordes. But only if we redouble our efforts in combating our forces, or combating our foes, and do whatever it takes to keep the British the spirit of British fascism burning. If we want something done, for many British workers, the end of the Blitz had only ushered in a new era of hardships. While German planes no longer rained hell upon their homes and businesses every night, a more silent and visible enemy had taken place. Uh, the specter of hunger and poverty crept across the nation as the government floundered in its efforts to rebuild the country, too wrapped up in its own internal squabblings and arguments to care. In an environment like this, small business uh, suffered, and the green grocery owned by one Alfred Roberts was no exception, of course. A local alderman with a happy family, his business was affected just as much as by the post-war devastation. However, the self who better than most had managed to continue to live comfortably with smile. It would become as a genuine shock to anyone who knew the family that Robert's daughter, Margaret, had been helping the resistance by making bombs for the last five years. She had initially done it so out of spite. As a woman ambition stifled by the lack of social mobility provided by the government, she felt it proper to put her unused chemistry knowledge towards a cause that would chip away the establishment to keep it back after there. But after uh, having met with local resistance members on and off for the past half decade, Roberts had slowly begun to sympathize with the cause. It was a perfect relationship. Nobody would be suspected as resistance grew in size and strength. It was a rainy Thursday morning when she dropped off her last package off. She deposited a large parcel wrapped in a brown bag at her usual de deposit point uh, before walking away, acting as, enough, as if nothing had happened. Little did Margaret Roberts know that she just set in motion a series of events that would change Britain forever. Perhaps forever. Hail hath no fury. Huh. Funny. Mobilizing the FBC, as much as it pains us to admit it. La Lalos is plaguing her, she has gone up much too far out of, her, of hand for us to handle on her own. The treasonous wretches in Himmler, once content to silently scurry about in the shadows like the rats they are, now proudly proclaim their hatred for Britain and its people, stirring up troubles wherever they can. This cannot be allowed to stand. This means 
Uh, we're going to, have to swallow our pride and beseech flesh to fully deploy Hollow Cooper and his band of lunatics in the BFC to help and restore the peace. The restrictions we previously kept in check with shall be loosened. Make no mistake, the man is an odious butcher who seems more loyal to the Germania than anyone else. However, the efficiency of him, himself and his cronies make him too valuable of an asset to not use. Uh, Pygmalion. Dava breathed a sigh of relief as he entered his home. Ever since how Adolf Hitler had died, it is felt as if the cracks within the party had begun to run out of control. The German Gears had promised to stay and preserve order, whatever happens on the mainland. It felt like a thousand fires were lighting up all over Britain, still, this was why he took the job of Prime Minister. He couldn't trust anyone else with his job, especially since the resistance seemed to be getting bolder. Darn them, darn them all. Didn't they understand? This was better for Britain, and what did they want to accomplish in its place? All the violence, all for no nothing more than the destruction of Britain. The very thought of them made him sick, but the very least today he could start to resist. And nothing else, it seemed that Maxwell Knight was making progress in the resistance. Thank God for that. With the instability in Europe, it was more important than ever that Britain remained stable. If taking the red box upstairs, he could read it there, and at least he'd end the day with some good news after today. God Almighty helped to provide him with the strength to see his trials through, but Butler on his own part. I put on his sleep robes in a sleeping cab, and he settled on the bed, pushing away intrusive thoughts about the state of the country. He, a terrifying roar rattled his bones as he fell out of bed. An instinctual primordial fear as something so loud so rattled his bones. Something so loud so close rattled his bones. What in God's name is, he stopped thinking about it and immediately walked downstairs and out of his apartment. Dear God, 10 Downing Street. Officer of the Prime Minister, his neighbor's house was in flames. Because we see the fires burning within the windows, their flames licking the outdoors. The policemen were frantic, calling for backup for the fire department and warning the government. The Chancellor could only look on as Britain's last hope for peace went up in flames. The lions begin to tear themselves. Most aspects of Barry Downfall's performance as Prime Minister will be rated at once. Welcome, Ronald Null Kane. Although Ronald Null Kane did not want to be in the, this position, no sane man would ever. Uh, least of all, the man who enjoyed a little personal popularity, a recognition beyond his position as foreign secretary under Donville, but fate has a cruel sense of humor. As to the treacherous dogs that populate the resistance, when news of Donville's assassination by none other than Maxwell Knight came to light, the fragile order that the British People's Party had carved out over Britain's fair shores came crumbling to a swift and brutal end. Rapidly installed as interim prime minister due to his ties with the Reich, and lack of genuine partisan alignment. Now Kane is now faced with a nation in flames. His task is to restore order and crush Himmler at any and all costs. A daunting to ask, that mostly we shy away from and fear, ironically. The state of emergency has provided a Nal Kane, a luxury Donville could never quite experience. For once, the many faces of the party had ceased their constant bickering and now find themselves willing to rally together to get some resistance. From Holly Cooper's men in the British Free Corps to the reformists in the party, the majority of the government is finally united. Unluckily for him, though, Himmler is a dedicated movement, a weed with roots so deep in the country that removing them will be an arduous task. I might say, and some might say, not impossible to ask. The fate of Britain relies on the balance, and it's up to Nal Kane and his allies to prevent pure anarchy. And here's the name of the Nal Kane cabinet. Signed, Ronald Nal Kane. Good luck! Oh, German corporate dominance. Look at this one. Uh, Honor Majesty's Secret Service. The side of the troops was never particularly a strange side and at MI5, being one of the most heavily guarded buildings in London, yet the side of troops barging into the building wasn't particularly a usual occurrence. But the news of Donville's death and Knight's appearance connected to it, a small force of German and English soldiers burst into the building expecting a heated resistance from Britain's new minted and most fa famous trouble. As they walked cautiously through the building, they found nothing. There were no bombs and resistance members holed up in the balconies, but even stranger, they found no employees to speak of. Well, until they marched to the main offices, inside they found a small group made up of, of a variety of agents and civil servants. Instinctively, they pointed guns at the pack with the guns pointed at him. Kim Philby, the pointed leader of the pack, offered a small smile, replying cautiously, Stand out, my friends. We heard the news as well as about Maxwell, and as loyal citizens, we came to see what we could do to help Britain in the Starker Tower. The commander stared closely at him just before barging past and moving towards Knight's office. Inside the office, the paper was strewn across the room, every document seemingly missing or destroyed. A closer examination offered a little more information, but confirmation that the cabinets had been completely emptied of all the documents. The only intact document in the entire room was a photo propped up on the knight's desk containing only one figure, the exile Queen Elizabeth. With this, the troops left, and as they left under his breath, Phil, be glad he hadn't been shot by now, offered to silent thanks and commented, This never happened to the other fellow. As we're invoking state measures, do we explode now? Oh boy, out of the frying pan. The word panic did not quite convey the levels of sheer chaos and fear that engulfed Ben's platform, or pl platoon. They had been basic training just a few weeks ago when all of a sudden they had been ordered to ship out to the capital and that was a state of abject emergency. There had been no direct confirmation of what was going on just yet, but rumors would always spread and these rumors were shockingly consistent. It was being said that Downing Street had just been blown up with the Prime Minister inside. Ben didn't want to quite believe it. No one did. 
Uh, he neither looked up to or just like the Prime Minister on a personal level. Indeed, how many Englishmen of his age could generally claim to hold much in common with the likes of Barry Donville? But still the man who, who led Barry and Ben's country alongside the king himself, and when he joined the army, Ben was warned to defend both king and country. To rather resistance to attack both so, so brazenly like this could only mean trouble and did not like it one bit. As the old military transport or Trondo down the road, few of the men were speaking. Usually, they would be joking around with each other by now or at least exchanging words with each other, but instead it felt as if they were gathered at a funeral. Hush whispers were exchanged as many of them stared vacantly onwards. They all knew what they had signed up for and joined the military, but none of them would, would have expected for anything major to occur this soon. It was at this moment that Ben could still remember what his mother had said to him when he told her that he had signed up. The sentence echoed in Ben's head as the prospect of combat dangled over him. I don't want to lose you too. And an old colonel's glory. You know what I see when I look over these hangars, Lieutenant Colonel Kenneth Hawkins said, asked his assistant. As they surveyed the grounds in, of the aging Royal Air Force Base which he had been placed in charge of, its heyday is long gone. Back in the 30s and 40s, it was the key defense of the British Isles, linchpin of the uh, Irish Sea, yet now it has been left to decay. The bigwigs in Westminster don't consider renovating the base a high priority, and most folks who sign up for the RAF consider an assignment to this small island as sentencing to mediocrity. No one makes it a name at this base. So, sir, do you think we ought to surrender? His assistant half asked. Uh, the smaller man readjusting his uniform, which was just a bat tad too large for its center frame. We're going to destroy the base and prevent Himmler reports from getting their hands on weapons and planes. Hawkins shook his head immediately at the suggestion. No, 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 he said. Firmly, once more looking over the hangars, we may be asked from our forces, surrounded on the coast with a threat of Himmler attack, but I will not surrender this base to them unless it's over my cold, decaying corpse. They'll have to bomb this island into the Stone Age if they want it. Get out of notepad, Hawkins ordered. He once saw his assistant holding his pen. Just above the top of his notepad, he started, I want to drill before any Himmler forces decide to attack. Get the men ready to defend the island at a moment's notice. I want forced decision on all major overlooks facing towards the mainland. We need bunkers to defend the beaches. I want an inspection for our army. I don't want any of our weapons breaking when we need them. I want this base to be as ready for war as soon as it was in the 30s. Hawkins gave another glance over his base and his hangars. If they could save the forces on the mainland, just one hour of attack by distracting Himmler's forces with an invasion of their island, then that would be enough. Anything to protect civilization in Britain. Surrender is a coward's choice. The man shall stand. Decision categories now enabled the decision staff. Ah, oh, shnikes. Well, we once expected to be a simple police affair between the local constabulary and some hooligans that taking much darker affair. It's no longer an insurgency. We're dealing with a civil war. One that deemed fit to spread even to the quietest Id idols of Little England. The resistance Himmler's planning to open up a new front in the Isle of Man and normally forgotten country said this turned into Washington's potential pipeline supplies to our enemies. However, standing a chance of victory, we must defend the landing fields at any cost. The resistance will attack any one of the five different spots on the island. The job of our counterintelligence service is to make sure that they don't attack where, where we are most vulnerable. Our weaponry is the amount of weapons and uh, supplies that we invested into man and to prevent a breakthrough by him and sources. Be warned, the more we invest in the island, the defense, the cost here shall become potentially diverting from other fronts of the war. As each section or sector comes under attack, devoting weapons to the efforts will hold them back, but it's up to you, Prime Minister, to prioritize which area needs weapons most. If these states fall, we'll have no choice but to evacuate the island, leaving it in Washington's hands. Pa Aaron, Douglas Onchan, Ramsey, Kirk Michael, Point of Ire. Intel is changing, getting lower and lower. Oh, God. Weaponry. So far, man is under zero attacks out of eight possible. Losing three or more states will cause an evacuation from the Isle. The longer it holds, the better. How big is the Isle of Man? Intel, Himmler's, and weaponry decrease. The evacuation can wait. The fight goes on. If Himmler's Intel outranks ours, then they'll target the least defended state of the man to attack and reverse the case of what happened. A mine set up artillery. The loss of defensiveness after successful defense will decrease. Distribute the police. Direct the panzers to the point of fire. Oh god. Him that's it will increase by 5%. Him that's bi weekly into will gain by more. Our weekly violent will decrease. Yeah. Let's see this. Weapon will increase. That's good. Uh, weapon will increase more money. Weapon will increase. Their, their intel will decrease. I don't like that they get more gain, though. Oh, God. 
our intel will increase. Plant fake evidence was good. What is this? Our intel bi-weekly gain will increase by 2.5%. Himmler's intel bi-weekly gain will decrease by one. That's the one we want to definitely choose. Uh, I don't mind having them fall. Um, I want to keep this one. Do I an on Chan? Probably uh, oh, is this 10%. 5.5. Um, well, there's both 5%. 10 days. Is this Intel as well? Changes, it goes up by one week. Fuel has no cost. That'd be nice. A greatest lie ever told. Many women of a free Britain. Readers across the aisle chatter to life, bringing forth a sentence to those who didn't. The so-called new order, of which all the fools in Europe have touted for years and years, has proven itself to be nothing more than an architect of her deaths and its frail Apollo, Admiral Donville's dead. Our so-called overlord has abandoned their fascist pawns in Westminster, and now more than ever is the time to call for their annihilation. Oh, God. To deep within a bunker in a Lancastrian hillside, three men sat before a microphone broadcasting their final manifesto to those across Britain. McLean and Jones were among the trio, yet another man had now finally joined them. That man before them were delivering their life's work. If you seek proof that our masters are little more than t paper tigers, unfit to rule over us, look no further than their inability to catch the man of the greatest obsession, only to find that not only by their actions, but that that man hid amongst them. My name is Charlie Henry Maxwell Knight, and for years I worked in MI5. For years, however, I also led Her Majesty's Most Loyal Resistance. I'm sure those amongst you remember the Cable Street. In 1956, when our brightest hopes were dashed by the clubs of Germans, I ask you to remember that day, but not to despair on it. Alexander and Sterling gave their lives for our cause that day, and out of it, we moved to cover our resistance in the shadows. I'm now stepping forth out of those shadows. Remember not only Cable Street, but remember those across the streets, the seas that today resist. Remember our own people who were taken from their homes that have never returned, and most importantly, remember what Britain once was before the fascists crept into our isle. I ask you to hold these, but not to despair, for now we crowd revolution, a revolution of the highest magnitude. We stand at the crux of the new order, uh, of their new order, and at this moment shattering and rise, rise those who truly believe, those who hold themselves the truth that Britain's torch will never be extinguished. The months ahead will be our most brutal and tragic, yet if you truly believe these sufferings compare not to a moment longer under the rule of an ideology which has scorched us for twenty years in the name of Britain rise. Once more into the breach, my dear friends, once more. Oh god. And we're at war. Oh god. Our worst nightmare. Britannia, oh you glorious and wondrous thing, time and time again you have showcased to the world your strength and intelligence, your kindness and wisdom. You preserved in the best and worst times, standing up against all forces, yet surviving nonetheless. Why then are you divided once more? Our greatest fear has been realized as the resistance has fall risen up across the country. Cities fall under her banners of her majesty's most loyal resistance. Once more blood is spilled on the isle. Um, our island is thrown back into chaos as young men and former soldiers take up arms once more. Our position looks untenable and our government is divided, yet we cannot fall or fail. For king and, for king and country, we must succeed. Oh, great. Fantastic. Chimes midnight, military confidence. And what does the future bring to answer this? I have to live through it. Okay, interesting. Bi-weekly structural exhaustion, huh? Combat acclimation. we we'll are trying to set up the defense, we'll keep walking past it. Less defense, more planning speed, oh. Called structural exhaustion. It's working, it's breathing, it's looking and helping. Oh. Countries wage war, structures support countries' formula, as well as states themselves. To truly win a war where it's living in behind, uh, it must be a mechanism with its parts interconnected. Ever working. If it falls and war falls, and so do we, to keep the country alive by any means. What is this? So, it's probably military confidence? Yeah. Uh, war is not only a matter of if and why, but those under the reign of metal is of when and how. Capturing enemy territory, causing them casualties, anything works to not turn our army and its high command undead, to risk their lives under past victories, or strike and win, this will do. Combat acclamation. A land of peace is an ever changing place, even if little by little. <laughs> A land of war can either stand deathly still or become unrecognizable within seconds. It's easier to organize defenses than the latter case, which itself, uh, in itself can be caused by the situation on the front lines. Not change too rapidly, too fast. Locate and overwhelm. Way more decryption than night attack and breakthrough. Wow. 
Not bad. Pin down and outmaneuver. Own combat with. Oh boy. Save the trapped. Hey, get political power. That's not bad. Seize of petrol. Structural damage. Oh, that's good. Repair the roads. Relocate the weaponry. Infiltrate all the layers. Interesting. And then show fortification decisions. What is this? Less political, for political power. Hey, military confidence goes up, which is pretty nice. Interesting. What is this? Okay. Um, so I'm going to organize this and get ready for the next episode in which we will defend as best we can. And hopefully not poop the bed because we don't want to die here. So, hey, if you enjoyed this episode, in the next episode we'll get ready to go to war with everybody. Or I guess we'll go to war with Rebrand. Um, please consider leaving a like. Subscribe if you're new. Look at this guy. Check out my Discord link in the description below. And I'll see you tomorrow as we'll see what we can do with securing the United Kingdom. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.